Good evening. Good evening. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Feels like such a small thing that we do for the Lord, don't it? And yet God does mighty things through the little bit that we do. Every time I get an email from somebody, either about getting saved or learning how to understand the Bible or just how they're growing in the Lord for more ministry, I just think, I ain't doing nothing except reading the book and telling you what it says. And uh, it's just amazing what God does through those things. What is it Paul said over there? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The f something that's foolish to this world is the power of the believer. And Paul, Paul says something over there that God's foolishness is wiser than men. You see, but see, a lot of the times we try to match wits with men because we have no confidence in the power of God. And God's, God's foolishness is wiser than men and his weakness is stronger than men. And if we just preach the gospel of Christ, God does mighty things through it. Amen. He changes lives, transforms them, saves people from eternal hell. And we get to participate in that with just, just by being as faithful as we are. We get to participate in what God's doing today. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. Paul here, beginning in verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. Now, notice there's thanksgiving and a request that Paul makes for them. He thanks God for them and he makes, he makes requests for them. Now, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. And so tonight I want to talk, I want to take a look at this prayer of Paul for the Philippian church in anticipation of the day of Christ. Now, what do we know about the day of Christ, guys? What do we know about it? For years, most of you probably taught it was the rapture. Yeah. Right? You got guys out here that believe, that say they believe in a pre-70th week rapture, right? A rapture of the church prior to the 70th week of Daniel. But Paul tells you that the day of Christ can't come to the man of sin is revealed, don't he? Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't he say that, 2 Thessalonians? When is the man of sin revealed? He's revealed as the, as the one who opposeth and exalts. The revelation of that man of sin, Christ told you about it, Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. So the day of Christ can't happen till the man of sin stands in the holy place there. Midpoint of the 70th week of Daniel. That puts the day of Christ at least out beyond that point, don't it? Now, how is, it, how is it that men claim to believe in this doctrine right here, confuse it with this thing right here? The first time Paul uses this phrase is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The last time he uses this phrase in his church epistle, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in both places, he makes it clear that the rapture and that event are two separate events. Both times. But what Paul what Paul's talking about now is in anticipation of this day. Because God is doing something at this present time 
in, with his church in anticipation of the day of Christ. Do you know the day of Christ is when the church is going to reign with Christ from the heavenly places? When that seventh angel sounds in the book of Revelation, you know what they say? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Amen. Amen. And he shall reign forever and ever. Are you going to reign with him? You, you see, and this is what Paul, Paul was in anticipation of this day of Christ, not just the rapture. And Paul, Paul in this prayer for the Philippian church Paul's in bonds and he's praying for this church and that there's two parts to his prayer. If you look back in verse three, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making what? Request with joy. So Paul's prayer consists of a, of a thanksgiving to God for these Philippian believers and a request to God with joy. <clears throat> Now his thanksgiving is in verse 5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's thanksgiving to God for these Philippian believers was for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. They hadn't turned on Paul. They hadn't turned away from the gospel. Hadn't, listen, man, finding people that will stick with you in this thing is rare. I've told many of you, man, if I had a nickel for every person that come up, blew, tried, to, tried to blow smoke around me and say, oh, oh, we've learned so much from you and we've never heard this stuff before. And six months later, they disappeared like, a, like gas in the wind, you know. They're just gone. You never hear from them again. We've had a couple of them here. You know, David Osteen, it's an old Baptist saying, man, but we'll rip it out anyway. He said, a man's greatest ability is his dependability. Because right. I don't care how gifted you are, if I can't depend on you, then it's of no value. Right. Right. right? This church, Paul was thankful for this church because of their fellowship. In fact, if you look over in chapter 4, look at what he says about them. We know from 2 Corinthians that the Macedonian saints were poorer than the saints at Achaia. We know the Philippian church was not a, a rich church. And yet look at what Paul says in 4.15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Amen. The Philippian church was a faithful church. Paul was thankful for him. He was thankful from the first day. This means, this means from the first day that Paul went and delivered unto them the gospel all the way up here to when he was in bonds, this Philippian church had been in fellowship with that gospel from that first day until now. Amen. They were faithful. They were faithful. And because of that, Paul's thankful for him. Now look, that, that, that fact alone is why Paul says what he does in verse 6. We misuse verse 6 as a passage on eternal security. That's not a passage on eternal security. That is a passage about Paul's confidence in what's going on in this Philippian church. Amen? Being confident. What is Paul, when Paul, in other words, when Paul lifts up this prayer to God and he's, he's thankful for this church's fellowship, he's also confident that as he's making requests to God with joy, he's confident that the good work that God began in these Philippian believers, God is going to perform it until the day of Christ. He's confident in that. Amen? Now, the reality is, is would Paul have that confidence in every church? Look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 
Guys, God, God is faithful. Paul tells the Corinthians, he said, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. What's the problem? Men are not. Now, were the, was the Philippian church faithful? Yes. Was the Corinthian church? No. Because Paul don't have this confidence in the, in the Corinthian church. Because look at what he says, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear... Lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Is Paul confident in the Corinthian church? Or is Paul scared that this Corinthian church is going to receive another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel? Paul's scared. Look at, Gal look at Galatians chapter 3. Now remember, he that begun... Paul's confidence that this work was going to be performed until the day of Christ was because of their fellowship from the first day until now. Paul didn't have this confidence in Galatians. Look at what he says in verse 3. Galatians 3, 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Look at what he says in chapter 4, verse 11. I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. When it got out here, when the Galatian church got out here, Paul, now the Philippian church, their fellowship in the gospel was faithful. The Galatian church, Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him. And now he writes to that Galatian church and says, I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed labor upon you in vain. You see, Philippians 1.6 is just another example of a passage that people use as a proof text for eternal security and they rip it out of its context. Amen. Right. Amen. Look at what he says in Galatians 4.19. 4, 4.20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Does, it, does Paul, does, does that sound like to say Paul who said being confident of this very thing? Or is Paul scared that the labor he bestowed upon the Galatians was in vain? Is he scared? Does he, does he stand in doubt of them? Does he have confidence in them? He tells them in chapter 5, you did run well. Who did hinder you? That you should not obey the truth. The Galatian church somewhere along the way stumbled. And Paul now is in doubt of them. He's afraid of them. Amen. Y'all with me? So Philippians 1.6 is Paul's confidence that when he prays to God. And he brings into remembrance this church's fellowship from the first day until now. He's confident that this good work that's begun in them is going to be performed until the day of Christ. Paul makes request for this church with joy and in confidence of them all. Amen. Verse 7 and 8. The reason I pointed all this out, guys, is what is Paul's request for this church. We know what his thankfulness is. But what's Paul's request at this present time for this church? What is, what is the good work that begun in them that Paul's asking God in confidence to keep doing and to perform in this church? Well, verse 7 and 8 is an explanation of his confidence in verse 6. You got to understand that. You see the colon at the end of verse 6? Verse 7 and 8 is why Paul is confident in the fact that he just stated in verse 6. But it's in verse 9 where you get to the request that Paul's making for them. And this I pray. So, here, let me sum this up. Paul's thankfulness for their fellowship from the first day until now. His confidence that as he prays making requests for God to this church, 
that the good work God started in them, he's going to perform to the day of Christ. And verse 9 is Paul's prayer for that church. There's his request for that church. And this I pray, that your love, there's four parts to this now. Paul asked for four things. And so Paul's request to the, for the Philippians in the confidence that he has in verse 6 is that the good work that had begun, Paul's asking God to keep performing it, and right there it is in verse 9, 10, and 11. It has nothing to do with anybody going to heaven. Amen? Yeah. Guys, there's nothing about eternal security anywhere in this chapter. Amen. Verse 9, 10, and 11, the request Paul makes in confidence for this church has nothing to do with them going to heaven, getting their sins forgiven, or any of that. What is, what is the good work that God had begun in them that Paul is asking now to, for them to have this work continue in them being perfected? Well, it's four parts to it. The first part is that their love would abound more and more in what? Knowledge and in all what? Judgment. That's the first part of the prayer. Second part of the prayer is that they would approve things that are excellent. Third part of the prayer is that they may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Fourth part of the prayer is for them to be being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. That means... That is what God is doing in us as we await in preparation and anticipation of the day of Christ. Four things there. You rarely hear about them. You rarely hear about these things. Amen? So first part of the prayer is that their love would abound in their knowledge and in all their judgment. Do you know what that means? Paul is saying that in every judgment that they make, Every choice, every decision. Guys, we make thousands of them a day. We make hundreds of choices and decisions a day. We make judgments all the time. These people running around, oh, judge not. You can't live without judging. Every time you come to a red light, you make a judgment. Amen? Every time that light turns yellow... You make a judgment. Am I going to stop? Am I going to keep going? Right? But we all, from the time we wake up until the time we go to bed, we're making choices and judgments and decisions in our life. Sure. And what Paul's prayer for the, Paul's request and what his prayer is for the Philippian church is that in every judgment, every choice, and every decision, Paul is praying for their love to abound in their knowledge in making these judgments. In everything that they do, in all judgment. Listen, guys, that means love and knowledge are the two essentials in having finely tuned discernment by which we approve the things of the most excellent value. You may be down here doing things that are good, you may be down here doing things that are acceptable. But Paul is talking about having love and knowledge in all of our judgment. When, when, when that love and that knowledge, those two things, when you have the mind of Christ and you know the love of Christ, those two things in all of your judgment is going to give you the ability to discern the things that are of the highest and most excellent value in the sight of God. Amen. Give you an example. This, this, here's, here's the Apostle Paul. Did God ordain that a man who preaches the gospel is to live with the gospel? God ordained that, didn't he? Paul never used that power. Amen? Would it have been acceptable for Paul to have made a living off of preaching the gospel? Yes. Was it more excellent for him to do it without charge? Amen? And this he said I do for the gospel's sake. Right? That's just an example. Guys, there are things that are good and acceptable. But Paul's talking about the Philippians 
continuing to abound in love and in knowledge in all judgment that they could approve the things that are of the most excellent, highest value in the sight of God. Things that are the approving of things that are excellent. You see that word excellent? I mean, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be too hard to understand what that word means. Things that excel, right? Things that are above everything else. Amen? And we are talking about approving things that are the most excellent, the things that excel, the things that are of the highest value. Now listen to me. Those two things that you need, knowledge and love. You know what knowledge is without love? Nothing. Nothing. It's nothing. Paul said, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have faith that can move mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. How much you know about that book doesn't make you of any value to this world if you don't have charity. You know what he said in 1 Corinthians 8? He says, we know that we have all knowledge. He says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Amen. But now, at the same token, do you know what love is without knowledge? Perversion. All this stuff of love, 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 lovey, dovey, 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 lovey, lovey, love, in ignorance of biblical truth becomes perverted and makes you acceptance in your judgment. Now, listen, if all you do is have love in your judgment without knowledge, when you judge things, you know what you're going to become? You're going to become tolerant and acceptable of some of the most vile, ungodly things in the world. But if you remove that and all you have is knowledge, you're going to become one of the most cruel, proud, egotistical, tyrannical people that's ever walked this earth. Amen. Amen. You, know, you know when the law, if the law is not tempered with mercy, the law becomes cruel. Did y'all know that? But did you know mercy without any knowledge of right and wrong, becomes perverted. We're talking about being balanced people. That through these two things abounding, this love abounding in knowledge and in all of our judgment, we become people that can approve and discern and, and, and approve and accept the most excellent things, the things of the highest value. That's what we call a man of discretion. A man that has discretion and discernment. Isn't that what Hebrews says? Hebrews chapter 5. That, that strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's what the word of God has given you is discernment. Amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 6. That charity rejoiceth not in iniquity but in the truth. Therefore. The world's love is perverted because it rejoices in iniquity. In fact, what most people are confusing with love today is not love at all. True biblical love rejoices in the truth. It rejoices in biblical truth. And you've got to have both of these. This one right here must abound in that knowledge in all of our judgment as we judge things and approve things that are excellent. And so in our exercise of judgment, come to Romans chapter 1, in our exercise of judgment, we must have love abounding in knowledge. I'm 42 years old, man. I've lived most of my life as a, as a foolish man. And sit back here and settle down, Ryan. We don't need no amens on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No discernment at all. 
But the, uh, I'm just now starting to understand, you know, I've been, I've been going, I've been in churches, man, I, I couldn't even tell you how many preachers I've heard in my life. It's got to be well into the hundreds. Men that I've heard preach the Bible. And this is stuff, this is stuff that I'm learning. I've learned from the Word of God that I haven't heard taught in my entire life. About teaching how the Word of God works. They just, they just get you saved and say, do it. Do what? Because the last time I read my Bible, there's none that understandeth. There's none that doeth good. Amen? Christ, the Word of God is doing a work in us. The, the work that God begun in us, He's going to perform to the day of Christ. And this is what He's doing. Is He's giving us knowledge and love so that we ourselves in our exercise of judgment and decisions and choices are becoming men that can approve the things of the most excellent value in heaven and earth. Amen? Knowing when to keep quiet. Knowing when to speak. Knowing when to love, when to hate. Knowing when to rebuke sharply and when to be gentle unto men. This is what, the only way you're going to know how to do that stuff, guys, is when your love is abounding in the knowledge that God has given you. Love is going to keep that knowledge in check. It's going to keep it from becoming puffed up. Amen. And so, and so in Romans chapter 1, look at what Paul says here. I want you to notice the contrast between Romans 1 and Philippians 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. According to that passage, what is a reprobate mind? It is a mind that has rejected the knowledge of God. It is a mind that has no knowledge of God. And so the mind, void of the knowledge of God, instead of approving the things that are excellent, what do they do? Things which are not what? Convenient. Things that are not suitable. Do you know what it means? The, the definition of convenience is suitable for the time and place. Man walking around as reprobates, or doing things that are not suitable for the time and place. Not for the earth, not for the time they live in. Instead of approving things that are excellent because they have a mind void of the knowledge of God. Now remember what Paul said in Philippians. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. What are they being filled with in Romans 1.29? Being filled with all unrighteousness. It all begins right here in the knowledge. Men are either walking around with the knowledge of God and the choices and the decisions they're making in their life is coming from a place of knowing God or they're walking through this life making choice after choice after choice with a reprobate mind that's void of the knowledge of God. Amen? One of them leads to approving the things that are excellent one of them leads to doing the things which are not convenient. One of them leads to being filled with the fruits of righteousness by Jesus Christ. One of them is, is led to being filled with all unrighteousness. But it all begins in the mind and how man. Listen, it didn't begin with God giving them over. It began with man not liking to retain God in their knowledge. It begins when man says, I don't want to know God. He's an inconvenient truth for how I want to live my life. That's where it begins. Amen. And so Paul says this here. They do not like to retain God. That reprobate mind. A reprobate mind being a mind void of God's knowledge. And yet they make judgments and decisions on a daily basis. How does that make you feel? That seven and a half billion people are running around in God's world making thousands of the choices about war, economy, 
how to teach little kids in the classroom, how to raise mom or how, how to be moms and dads, how to be husbands and wives. They're all running around. You ain't going to, you can't just stop the world. But seven and a half billion people are running around this world with no desire to know God and yet they make thousands of decisions and choices on a daily basis and man's got the audacity to look up at God and say, why do you let this go on? As if God's the one making the choices. You got it? I've seen seen families, man, get shredded. I've seen them get shredded. And then they have the audacity. They never read the Bible. They never went to church. They never did all that. And then when their families go by the wayside, they sit and say, I prayed that God would keep our family together. And he didn't do it. So you got a misunderstanding of how God works. God is not your genie. He's your savior. He's your God. He's your Lord. He's your teacher. He's your counselor. He's not up there just sitting and saying, okay, I'm just, as soon as they make, as soon as they mess up, I'm going to wait for them. I'm going to get out my pixie dust and sprinkle it on them and just fix everything. There's a price to pay for being a reprobate. There's a price to pay for making thousands of choices in your life. Listen, man. I tell, I've told my boys this. I told my, my son this the other day. That road away from God doesn't start out that bad, but it never gets better. It degrades. Not a person on Kensington, not a person laying in a gutter today with heroin and fentanyl addiction began that way. It started stealing a beer out of the fridge for mom and dad. But that road degrades. I promise you, one bad, you, you start making a habit of making choices in your life with no knowledge of God and it's going to lead nowhere. I've seen both sides of it, Bill. Haven't you, brother? Brother Gary, you've seen both sides of it? Leads to destruction. Destruction and misery are in their ways, Brother Russell. Paul tells you there in Romans 1 29 all the things that result from it fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You see that stuff there? And these people run around and say, I'll tell you what I would do. (laughs) Excuse me while I put my earplugs in. Because nobody cares what you would do. Not any person that with a sane mind cares about any counsel of man. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. And yet, you have people in this world that think it's good advice to say, just follow your heart. It's deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. And see, I'm one of these nuts that read that in my King James Bible and I started believing it. And you know what my greatest fear become? My own heart. Amen. Me and God's got me and God's got got something worked out, boys. I told him a long time ago I was an idiot. And I'd really appreciate it if he'd keep me from my own destruction and keep me from being stupid and making bad choices in my life. Amen. You and God had that conversation. <laughs> Well, you need to, but that's a reprobate. Look at Romans 12. Look at Romans 12. The 
Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. So the mind of man is reprobate. Well, if the reprobate mind is a mind void of the knowledge of God, what do you think God wants? How do you think God wants you to renew your mind? So if you're reprobate, you have no ability to judge and prove what is acceptable to God. It's impossible. You don't know him. And so God wants to renew the mind of man. The way he does it is with doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. The Bible's plumb full, man. Knowing this. Knowing that. What is it Solomon said over there? He says, he says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and get understanding. Forsake her not, she will exalt thee. Then he says, he says, therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. Another place he says, buy the truth and sell it not. Amen. These things about God or the things God wants us to know. For example, when he says know this, then know it. When he says know ye not, and you understand that he's saying that because he's saying you cannot function in ignorance of this knowledge, then folks, you better park there a little bit and not move away until you know what Paul wants you to know and not be ignorant of. When he tells you reckon Yield, obey, when he says flee, youthful lust, follow after this, withdraw from this, shun this, and all, when he says do those things, those, that's knowledge God is giving you in your mind. Now you don't always know how to apply that stuff, guys, but it's there. You've gone from a reprobate to now having a mind that's no longer ignorant of the things of God. Now as you walk through life, you're going to start making judgments and decisions. But instead of doing them as a reprobate that can't look inwardly and say, what does God want me to do? How does God want me to respond right here? You now have a mind by which you yourself can go and judge and prove what is acceptable unto God. That's how you're transformed. Not conformed to this world, but transformed. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that new mind give you? Look at what he says there. By the renewing of your mind that ye may what? Prove. You know what prove means? It means to judge. It means to probe, examine. When we go into a courtroom... A man's proven guilty. What does that mean? If you prove a man guilty beyond all reasonable doubt, how did you do that? You proved that by examination of evidence. You tried it. There was a whole trial process before you got to the point of proving that man. So how do you think God wants you to prove his will? By examination. <clears throat> It's not just, listen guys, nine times out of ten, the first response is the wrong one. Amen? A rash man is going to have a lot. What is it God said? He says, I'm not man that I should lie, neither the son of man that I shall repent. God has never spoke rashly in his life. He's never spoken and said, I wish I could take that back. God is very forward with his words. He's very meaningful with his words. How many times have you said something in your life and then sat two hours later and be like, why in the world did I say that? This is what, this is what the Bible talks about all these qualities, guys. Circumspect. Over there where it tells young women to be discreet. That means to be cautious, to be circumspect, people of judgment. 
Amen. I tell people all the time, Bill, I'd rather, I'd rather give somebody nothing than give them the wrong thing. There you go. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I'd rather say nothing at all than to say the wrong thing sometimes. This is why a fool is known by a multitude of what? You know why he's a fool? Because he has yet to realize how dangerous his tongue is and how little he knows. A wise man says, I better be careful with what I say here. And I've not always been like that, guys. I really haven't. Now, now, now that being said, it tells me America's plumb full of fools. In any, any country, it has 24-hour news where all they're doing is just blah, 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 blah. And Twitter, blah, 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 blah. Facebook, blah, 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 blah. That's a nation of fools. You hear me? Oh, preacher. Oh, preacher. You'll get over it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with any of those platforms. That's not. <laughs> I don't care if anybody. I believe good can come out of those platforms. I mean, look at me. I get up here and run my mouth for hours at a time. Good can come out of those platforms if, those, if your tongue is being governed by these two things right here. That's the point. Is knowing how to use that tongue correctly. And so, and so what God wants us to do is to prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. What is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. By us having this new mind and then probing, examining, trying, and judging what is the good, good, acceptable things of God? Amen. Look over in 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Guys, I'll tell you what Solomon said. Man, I give you good doctrine. You, you young people out there, there's no, I mean, Gary's, Gary's on the back nine of this thing, man. He's teeing off on 18. This stuff is of no value to him. <laughs> no. No. I'll tell you young people something. Bill and Gary and them come up at a time, man, where there was still godly counsel and godly advice going around, even from lost people for the most part. You young people live in a world where the world's morals and standards have degraded to that of a hog. Amen. Yeah. Hogs have better standards than modern man. Yeah. Amen. Not much because a pig will eat her own young. And mothers and human mothers do that all the time. Amen. But they've degraded. I want to tell you young people something. If you'll do what I'm telling you and you make these things the keys of your life, they're going to save you a lot of heartache in your life. Amen. They're going to save you a lot of heartache in your life. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, The natural man, verse 14, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually what? The natural man has no ability to know or to discern the things of the Spirit of God. Amen? Y'all ever heard people say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual? Is that, is that so? Because being spiritual has a real definition to it. Did you know that? It's in verse 15. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. So what is a spiritual man? A spiritual man is a man that has discernment and judgment of all things. The natural man has no ability to discern the things of the Spirit of God. A natural, get this now, a natural man has no ability to know or to understand the will of God. Zero. But the spiritual man discerns and judges all things. Yet he himself is what? Judged of no man. You know what that means? A man in the book 
with a spiritual mind is going to make no sense to this world. They're not going to understand the thing he's doing or why he's doing it. It makes no sense to them. They have no discernment of that man. Paul's proof, Paul's proof of this, I'll read you the passage. Paul's proof is a quote from Isaiah chapter 40. Over here, it says, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel and who instructed him? And taught him in the path of judgment. And taught him knowledge. And shewed to him the way of understanding. Who showed God understanding and knowledge and wisdom? Whoever gave God counsel and instructed him and taught him. And the natural man, the natural man's walking down here. And he cannot understand nor comprehend the wisdom and knowledge of God. He doesn't know what God's doing. But the spiritual man, Paul says, who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of who? Christ. You know what we have? You know what this new mind is? It's the mind of Christ. And you, let me tell you this now, you as a spiritual man being instructed by that mind of Christ will be as big a mystery to the natural man and the carnal Christian as God is. People will be just as ignorant of you as they are of God. That's why I don't care about the masses. Paul said the wisdom that we speak, we speak in a mystery. A wisdom that the natural man cannot discern or comprehend. But we have the mind of Christ. And the natural man ain't going to understand the judgments that you're making. The carnal man, the natural man will not understand why you're making the choices and, and the judgments that you're making. How many of y'all believe a carnal man would have looked at Paul and thought, what a wise man? A naked, beaten prisoner of Jesus Christ. How many of you would have looked at him? How many of the world would have looked at him and been like, that's who I want to be like? But Paul become that way because a long time ago in his life, he said, everything that is profitable, profitable to me is done for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The knowledge of who? Christ Jesus, my Lord. Look at Ephesians 3. So there's your knowledge. As you read that Bible, you are going from a reprobate to a man through the renewing of your mind, a man that has the mind of Christ. But look at Ephesians 3. I'm going to try not to keep you all too much longer. I'm going to try, I said. Do my best. Finally, my brethren. Look at Ephesians 3.16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Guys, I have stared at that prayer probably more than any passage in the Bible. I'm not lying on that. I have, it's one of those passages that I've read like that he and that ye. I've tried to read it weird and emphasize things, trying to understand it. And it was about four days ago that I finally come to understand the prayer and the passage. And it took me forever to understand it, Bill. And the only reason I do understand it now is because of the tribulations and things that I've suffered in my life. As a young, stupid boy, Bill, I ran for many signs of trouble. And the more I've grown in the Lord, the more I'm willing to walk through that trouble and that suffering. Amen? Amen. Guys, you're never going to know this love. Remember when Paul says, tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. If you're willing to endure the tribulation, you're going to learn experience. And that experience is going to, make you, is going to give you hope 
And that hope is going to make you not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. But if every time tribulation comes, you just give up, you're never going to get it. And what I've come to learn, look at verse 19 there, man. It seems like to be the most, it seems to me the most contradictory statement in the Bible. To know the love of Christ that passeth what? How do you know something beyond the grasp of knowledge? If there's something out there beyond knowledge, how do you know something that's beyond knowledge? You see why I've stared at the passage for so long? God's almost telling you to know something that you can't know. And you can't know it. Until Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Amen. And what does Paul mean by this? Listen guys. This love that Paul wants us to know cannot be written. You can't write papers about it. You can't teach on it. Because it's beyond knowledge. It can only be known by the man that knows it. And he's going to have a hard time explaining it to you. You say, what is it? Listen, I know it sounds contradictory. But you will only know this love when you are subject to Jesus Christ. And see how far that that will take you. See the depths and the lengths and the heights that if you will just bow down and say, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. And if you will have that mind and submit your heart to this man, what Paul just prayed is that God would grant you strength to be strengthened with might. Do you know what might is? It's ability. That God's Spirit would strengthen your inner man with ability that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in what? Love. May comprehend through that root the height, breadth, depth, and length, and to know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. If you just quit, give up, but if you're truly subject to Jesus Christ, and you start searching that mind, and you see it, and you say, oh, is that what you want me to do? Abba, Father, is that what you want me to do? You know what you're going to start comprehending? The love of that man. You're going to get over yourself. You're going to become sincere. There's not going to be any bitterness and malice and malignity and pride and vainglory mingled into your actions. There's going to be pure subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's his love that's going to begin to work in you. And you're going to really start understanding and comprehending just how great that love is. Because of what it's asking you to do. I'm waiting. Amen, preacher. Amen, amen, amen. It has nothing to do with your opinions. It has nothing to do with how you see things. This love is known by men who are submitted and subjected to that mind right there. And in times of turmoil, in times of chaos, in times of trouble, in times of suffering, those men go to that mind and say, what do you want me to do, Lord? Amen. And he says, just keep going. And you know what you start learning? God makes us always triumph. He makes us to always triumph through Christ. We can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. I'm learning that, Bill. And the more I start to see that, the more that heart starts pumping. Eternal.
because I'm not, I'm not the love of Christ, not something I'm reading in a book. It's something I'm knowing in myself. Amen. It's beyond knowledge. It's beyond theological studies. It's beyond systems of man, viewpoints. It's something you're only going to know when you yourself submit and subject yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul said in Colossians 1, 24, this is what he says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. The afflictions of who? Christ, where were they? In my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whose sufferings was Paul bearing? In his body. Christ. So whose love was constraining Paul to those things? Remember when he wrote in Galatians and says, From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen, guys. It was the love of Christ that taught Paul to go to those links. It was the love of Christ that constrained Paul to those things. Amen. Now, in, uh, in closing, in 20 minutes, no, the result of Christ dwelling in your heart, guys, as your heart searches his mind and submits, the way Christ indwells your heart it's through this mind of Christ and through faith, this, this mind of Christ comes into the heart where man is submitted to this new mind. And he's going to start putting, he's going to start putting into motion a law that you've never known in your life. People's like, we're not under the law. You're under the law of the spirit of life. You know why people don't want to be under the law? Because they love the law of sin. The law of life, the law of this spirit of life in Christ, guys, when it strengthens and moves into that heart, it starts putting a new law in motion in you that is contrary to the law of sin. Amen? And it's going to start giving you lust and desires that go against the flesh. And if you will walk after that spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that spirit is going to produce fruit in you. That does not grow naturally in man. Love and joy and peace and meekness and goodness. And temperance and faith. Is going to start being produced in you by the spirit of God. That long suffering, you're going to be able to endure and bear and, and do things you never thought you'd be able to do. That love abounding in your knowledge when it's exercised in all of your judgment is going to lead you to approval of what is excellent. It's going to give you discernment of the highest value. The word approval here in Philippians 1.10 is the opposite of reprove. That approval can only be done through proving. Why I say it's, it's the opposite of approve, reprove, and approve, that means something that's been proved and rejected, that one is something that's been proved and accepted. Amen? The only way you can get to approval is by proof, is by proving something, judging something. And the only way you're going to get to this approval, the only way you're going to be able to prove to the point of approving what is excellent is for you to have this knowledge of Christ and to know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. And then when you exercise judgment through diligent search of the mind of Christ and subjection to him and his love, you're going to be able to approve things that are of the greatest value. And I mean that, man. I mean it. I've seen it work in my own life. I'm far from getting there. I'm far from of attaining under the perfect knowledge of God's Son. But I've got glimpses of it, Bill. 
I've gotten glimpses of that mind and that love working in me and groaning. Brother Gary was talking about it earlier. We talk a lot about the sufferings of Christ, but we don't know them. We don't. What I'm starting to learn the sufferings of Christ are, man, Paul connects them back there in Romans 8 with the sufferings of this present time and the earnest expectation of the creature. Bill, the more I'm in this and the more I know Jesus Christ, the more I'm affected by every tear that a man cries. I mean it. I'm going through things in my, it'd be easy for me to just be like, nope, this is what I'm going to focus on. The love of Christ won't let me. I sit over in that house burdened about what's going on in my home, burdened about this man right here, burdened about all of you. We are living in a creation that's groaning, guys. And God's Son come into this world and cried, Abba, Father, and bared it and died for it. And you can't know that love. Don't tell me you know that love if you yourself are not groaning in the current condition of the creation and of the creature. Every person, every, every mom, every dad, every child that gets cancer should move you. Every time you hear of a brother falling to sin, it ought to crush your heart. That's the sufferings that we bear at this present time. Knowing the love of Christ. is as this creature groans and travails in pain, you and I as God's sons with this love of Christ working in us, we are groaning and bearing those sufferings. Every, every person that cries affects us. We weep with them that weep. We hurt with them that hurt. We suffer with them that suffer. Amen. And when we approve these things that are excellent, guys, when we come to that point of approving things that are excellent, you know what it's going to make you out here? I really am closing. Sincere. Do you know what sincere means? It actually, I can't remember if it was Latin or the Greek. I believe it's Latin. Sincera is the word for pure honey. It means honey without wax in it is what it means. What, when, when, when Paul wants us to be sincere, he wants us to be without mixture. Unadulterated. And you're only going to get to that point with knowledge and love purifying you. And it's through this judgment and approval of the things that are the most excellent that we're going to rid ourselves of bitterness, malice, wrath, envy, strife, vainglory. We're going to purify through that judgment. We're going to purify these things and we're going to become sincere. Rooted and grounded in sincerity. And be without what? Offense. Until when? The day of Christ being filled with what? When you become that sincere man through knowledge, through love, knowledge, in all your judgment, approving the things that are excellent, when you become sincere in Christ, you will be filled with all the fruits of righteousness. Love, long-suffering, Amen, joy, peace. All those things are going to flow out of you only once you become sincere. And we just showed you how to be sincere and without offense. You got to have the mind of Christ, know the love of Christ, and then through your own judgment, through this knowledge and love, approving the things that are excellent, you will become sincere, a man with no mixture of wrath and bitterness in those things. They'll still be there. But it's through your judgment that you purify those things out. You identify it. When you're getting ready to make a choice and you say, no, nah, there's bitterness there. I'm doing that because I'm bitter. Or I'm doing this because I'm mad. I'm doing this because I'm angry. And through that love and knowledge, you purge out those things there. And you only approve the things that are excellent in your judgment. Then when you act outwardly, you're doing it in sincerity. 
And that's what's going to produce those fruits of righteousness. And those fruits of righteousness are unto the glory and praise of God. Why? Because it's God that did the work in you. Amen. The good work that he begun. He's begun something in us, guys. And believe it or not, everything I just said is what you're going to use out here. The same things, this knowledge and love is going to be used out here as we reign with Christ and, and make judgments. When we judge angels and judge the world and all those things, those are the principles we're going to use. God is teaching those things to us because that's how he wants us to walk in judgment and acceptance of what is excellent. Any questions? All right. Uh, Lance. Closes out. Ha, 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 ha.